Welcome to another episode of Uncovered with one of your hosts, Jared Kimber, and one of your other hosts, well, they're in the other host, really, unless these dogs start barking. It's Bharat Sundaresan. <laughs> Uh, it, I said to you, what do you want to talk about? And you gave me a lot of boring stuff about Sheffield Shield, which obviously I ignored. Um, I despite know, the clearly. fact that I do think it was interesting that Will Sutherland made 25% of his career runs batting at number seven for Victoria after 20 games. But we're not going to, despite, I, I do want to go into that, obviously, but we're gonna, I'm going to skip that for a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about the Matthew Wade non-dismissal, I suppose. So... For all 12 of you who weren't on Twitter at the time and actually missed <laughs> what has happened, essentially, Australia were falling a little bit behind in the game. Uh, Mark Wood was bowling very fast to Matthew Wade. Uh, Matthew Wade tries to hook a short ball. I think it was off the bat, wasn't it? Into the helmet or off the gloves, whatever way. Hits the helmet, goes up in the air. Wood goes down to chase the ball. Um, and as he's going to chase the ball, uh, Wade and Wood get into a... You know, collision of some kind um and and for the next i don't know 15 seconds it seems to be joss butler walking almost to umpire to umpire without actually saying yeah. anything for for a long period of time in in that period uh because wade has to get his concussion check there's a pause in the game we start to see the replays it's a hilarious moment where Adam Gilchrist uh, realizes halfway through that Matthew Wade has got away with the most egregious <laughs> uh, uh, moment. But essentially what has happened is as the ball goes up in the air, Wade turns around, realizes it might be going towards his stumps. But instead of going directly towards his crease or towards the ball, he actually stops, pivots to his left, puts his leg out, puts his hand out in what is, it's one of the first things you're taught when you play Aussie rules football which is basically getting a, a, an arm over the body so the other person doesn't get a free run at the ball. Uh, there's obviously a slight collision. Matthew Wade gets back in his crease. The ball bounces. And then Joss Butler decides not to appeal. According to Joss Butler, because it was a practice match, which it wasn't a practice match. It was actually an official T20, wasn't it? But anyway, it was a practice-y match. Um, and at, at that stage, uh, there's no doubt. And he also said, Butler, that he didn't get a good look at it because he was watching the ball. And yet, the first thing he does, if you look at the replay, is he holds his arms out to the umpires to go, what has he just done? Um, also, I'm not sure how he didn't see it because that's where the ball was, was literally where Matthew Wade was tackling Mark Wood at the time. I have described it. I have many, many questions here, but I think the first thing is you are a trained umpire, right? I mean, of all the random stupid skills you have in your life, being a trained umpire is one of them. <laughs> if you had seen that from the striker's end... <laughs> if you had seen that from the striker's end, I don't think you would give that out. Uh, not really. Uh, and, and, and the thing with the whole thing is, uh, if you've seen Matthew Wade play cricket even for five minutes, especially with the bat, uh, he, he's got this weird... I mean, yeah, he is this brusque character. He's in your face. Uh, he's... At, Many part due times during his career, he's been highly disliked by uh, many of the opposition. I know for a while, uh, he was the number one on the hate list for a lot of Indian cricketers. It, it, it's just something mm -hmm. about him that uh, does, you know, piss opposition players off. But you, he's the kind of guy you want in your dressing room, right? Uh, he's the kind of guy who would stand up for you. There's something... Um, weirdly likable about him if if you are an Australian supporter or definitely if you're an Australian player. and he, But he's also got this, for someone like that, he also has got this cheekiness about him. Um, you don't know whether it's it's unintentional or whether it's intentional. He, he, you, you can picture him do stuff like this. I mean, even that little battle with Neil Wagner he had, very different circumstances and nothing to do with uh, laws of the game or anything. Uh, but when he kept like randomly getting his body into the line, even to like Length deliveries. He was just copying blows for the, the heck of it uh, back in 2019. He, he just does these strange things. And I guess uh, mm. one, uh, you know, one reason why we need to give credit to him is uh, if you are flouting the law, just go all out. <laughs> Do it the, in such a blatant fashion um, that you leave it to the, to the opposition captain or, or the umpire to take a call. Uh, and I still think it was very instinctive. He does play a lot of footy uh, in the off-season, doesn't he? And he played a lot of uh, Australian rules football growing up alongside Tim Payne. Uh, so, yeah, uh, look, at the end of the day, when stuff like that happens on the field, 
Um, as an umpire, you, you almost expect the opposition skipper to appeal for it or come up to you and say, what the heck was that? Like, you know, how mm. was that? And, and you just immediately, you know, give it out. But like, I think more than anything, more than what Matthew Wade did, what the umpires would have been surprised by at that point is the fact that Joss Butler uh, di didn't seem uh, keen enough to, like, you know, appeal for it. Who who knows, right, in the heat of the moment, maybe he thought in England were in front of the game or uh, maybe he it was so blatant that he was still in shock. That's also possible as the on-field captain. So there would have been, there could be a lot of factors that went, uh, you know, into... Uh, his decision not to appeal. I know later on he spoke about oh, how this wasn't a World Cup match and all that, uh, which has obviously been um, uh, construed in many different ways and he's been torn apart on social media, not for the first time in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but but as an umpire, there's really not much you can do. Uh, but at times just, you know, giggle and laugh at uh, what just happened. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, two... Both the umpires went up to Joss Butler, right? I as I, I think I said strikers end before. I meant non strikers end. I think if you're the umpire at the non strikers end, mm. I don't think you had a good view. So I think if the if the no. if the um captain had if Butler had appealed, he would have gone to the square leg umpire. I think the square leg umpire again didn't have a brilliant view of it, but I think the square leg umpire would have said it did feel like Matthew Wade has his hand out at one stage if he'd seen that, of course. <laughs> um. But Butler didn't seem to want that uh, to happen, and he hasn't appealed. As you said, there might be many different reasons for that. I think there's a couple of other parts to this. You're right. Matthew Wade is quite often one of the most hated people in cricket. He's not even always that liked in Australian cricket, let's be honest. Mm. Like, yeah, true. You know, it, Australian cricketers love him, but the Australian public is, you know, yeah. a bit up in the air about him. Um There's two really interesting parts to this. I talked to another friend um, about this, and... It, you've got someone getting hit in the head, right? Straight away, you and I have both seen a lot of players get hit in the head. The f their first instinct is not always that sensible. Yeah. Right? So, especially when you get hit in the head by someone with Mark Wood's pace. Yeah. Exactly. Even if it doesn't hurt that much, right? Like, you know, if he hits you in the yeah. head, you get sh shaken up, right? The second thing is, and we've seen this many times throughout cricket, that when the ball is going towards the stumps, batters make all sorts of weird. Um, errors. Yeah, I saw a, a guy in a club game once back away and belt the ball back into his own stumps. Uh, I remember, you know, the great Graham Gooch trying to pick the ball up. I think Shield Berry's piece, which I think is wrong today. I think he's got mm. it wrong, but we'll come to that in a minute. But yeah, Shield yeah. Berry's piece talks about the one where Len Hutton was swinging his bat towards the wicket keeper, right? Yeah. When the ball's going towards the stumps, batters do do weird things, right? And being hit in the head and that, all those combined. The only things I would say is that it doesn't really matter at a certain point. If he, even if he was confused, he wasn't making a V line for the ball and he wasn't mm. making a V line uh, for the crease. He was legitimately making a V line for Mark Wood. He gets his hand out. Um, I think you undersold his footy. Uh, you know, if had he not had cancer at a young age, he probably would have gone on yeah. to be a professional footballer. The cricket Famous was sort of yeah. the accident with, with, with Matty yeah. Wade, wasn't it? So from that perspective, he makes a very clear decision to get over towards Mark Wood and do that, right? But that's a mistake he made and he yeah. should have been punished. If you don't appeal for that, I don't see why anyone could be, you know, anyone could say, oh, you know, Matt, Matty Wade's done the wrong thing. He has, but yeah. that we, ha we, we have within the laws a way of punishing him, do we not? You just appeal. You, you just, that's why you have the appeals in place for anything, right? Like, and that's where uh, I'm, I'm the last person who pull, pulls up uh, a piece written by a fellow journalist and, uh, uh wants to even discuss it unless it, it is for praise, right? Unless I'm really uh, so impressed by it that I want to go out and say good, nice things about it. But for, for a change, I, I think in that same Shilbury piece, if I'm not mistaken, um, mm -hmm. there is the suggestion that maybe uh, in these circumstances, the umpire should just give it out without even uh, waiting for the opposition uh, you know captain to appeal firstly very rarely do you see something so blatantly like you know transpire on the cricket field like we just said with Matthew Wade uh, i don't know what like there could be a variety of factors and, and you're right i am one of those as well unfortunately in a in, in indian media versus england media game who did that exact thing that you saw happen in club cricket where i was uh, unnecessarily asked to open the batting 
and I, I got this inside edge and suddenly I could see the ball trickling towards the stumps and in my haste, I just smashed it into the stumps. The, the possibility was it would, it would have stopped right in front of the stump but like i knocked it out like the the middle stump went out i don't know if anyone else has been as uh scored a self goal of that nature in a game of cricket in the middle uh so so you're right uh, but here matthew Wade knew exactly what he was doing yes he was it on the head like you said at a high speed uh but he knew he knew what he was doing maybe he did it uh uh, subconsciously, I don't know what happened, you know, in that instant for Matthew Wade to do what he did. But again, to suggest that uh, when when these extreme examples or extreme incidents take place, that you should just completely change the law of the game, take the appeal out of the picture, even if only for one kind of dismissal. Uh, I think it's it it, it is a sign of silly uh, because the mm. appeals are there in 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 place for a reason. Um, otherwise, you're giving the umpire like complete control. Like, you know, you're saying uh, Stuart Broad can actually just hit someone on the pad and just keep running towards the dressing room or wherever he wants to. Uh, or, or like, well, you know, and, mean, and... let's work it out this way. Let's say you got an edge, right? And the, the batting and the bowling team doesn't pick it up, right? And it's an obvious edge and the umpire spots it straight away and no one, and for whatever reason, the fielding team does it, right? So in that situation, is Shieldberry saying that we should be... Because that's as obvious as what Matthew Wade did. Because yeah. from certain angles, the and from the umpire being straight on, they're going to see the edge a little bit better than everyone else did. As I said, from where the non-striker's umpire was and the square leg umpire's was, I'm not sure it's as obvious. The most obvious angle was Josh Butler's. Where, yes. You know, or, or Mark Wood's chest. Yeah. <laughs> they, they were the most yeah, obvious angles. So when we're talking about it being blatant from that perspective, so if, if Shieldberry is suddenly saying the umpire should be able to give that out, does that mean that we're just changing the laws on, on appealing based on, as you said, one extreme situation that's just happened? You're an umpire. If we took away appeals, what do you think would happen to cricket? I mean, games will finish in 25 minutes at times, uh, you know, especially at some certain levels of, of cricket, especially in junior cricket, uh, where... You know, uh, which is where I mean, where the whole grounding takes place for not just players but for umpires as well. Um, you know, I, I can think of many games that I've umpired where I've been in a hurry uh, for the game to finish, and like you know, I'm I, I'm suddenly in charge of uh, pulling that off, and I'm not even saying uh, I I'll start giving out when it's not out, but but then you take away a very important element element of of, of cricket as well, where yes, I mean. Even a batter is out only after the the opposition team or the bowler decides to ask the umpire. Unless, of course, you knock the off stump out, this uh, or or like you know the bales fall off. Something very obvious is that. But like you know, I mean, what it it there is, it's law thirty one. I even pulled it up on my wonderful uh, MCC laws of cricket app. So if you're an umpire, if you are a budding umpire, or you're just someone who wants to say a lot of things on Twitter, I think you better download this app. It's free, and, and 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 that's the thing. If if you just go through the law, Jared, uh, the appeal doesn't need to be made just then and there. It technically any appeal can be made before, uh, especially if it happens with the last ball of the over. You you're given so much time to appeal for for mm. any like any any form of dismissal uh, till the start of the next over, uh, uh, li yeah. literally. So you know you can case... call over as an umpire. Yeah, in this case, because Wade had the concussion protocols, Butler could have made the appeal right up until the next ball was live, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's not like a DRS where you have like a fixed time. Like, you know, of course you can appeal after the next ball is bowled, after the bowler has started his run-up uh, for the next ball. But yeah, uh, look, and it, so the, the kind of, I mean, the appeals for... Uh, the kind of dismissals that need to happen are, I mean, all of them, right? Except, except, except when you clean bowl someone. Um, and, and again, it's it's a part of the game for for a reason. Otherwise, uh, already, I mean, the umpire is there to officiate the game. He, he kind of has to, uh, he or she is in charge of the game and making sure that the laws of the game are forever, like you know, are played out the way they should in the. Uh, the game is played fairly. That's pretty much what our role is in the middle. Uh, but at the same time, if the opposition 
team do not want a batter out. I mean, there could be some strategy involved with, mm. a, a, as also, right? Especially if we are entering an era of um, all sorts of strategies, you know, uh, getting batters retired uh, out just so that we can get someone else in because somebody is not hitting the ball, you want them to. Uh, and when the game is going in that direction, uh, I'm sure there will be times in T20 cricket when when the opposition wants a batter to be in, in the middle, you know, even if it's a blatant LBW. I, I, I can see that happening. Most mm. bowlers will appeal. But there could be a time when the bowler says like, you know what, no, I, I like having him out in the middle because three more dot balls and the game turns in our direction. Yeah, no, I mean, that's very fair. You've got your laws. So just just so that everyone knows, 37.1, out obstructing the field. Either batter is out obstructing the field if and while the ball is in play, they, it says he, she, shouldn't they just say they? Anyway, they willfully attempt to obstruct or distract the fielding side by word or action, right? Uh, 37.2 says a batter shall not be out obstructing the field if the obstruction or distraction is accidental, right? Um there is 34.3, which doesn't really uh, play here, which says that the striker may solely in order to guard uh, their wicket. I've taken away his or her again there. Um, and before the ball has been touched by a fielder, lawfully strike the ball a second time. So you can hit the ball a second time. So if Wade was going back and the umpires thought that he was realistically trying to hit the ball away with his bat yes. or kick it with his foot, he can't pick it up with his hand, of course, but if he was to kick it with his foot or hit it with his bat because he thought it was going to land on his stumps, and they thought that was realistic, then that would have been given um, not not out had the appeal been made, of course. In this case, <laughs> Wade doesn't go anywhere near the ball. <laughs> he not goes really, to Wood, yeah. and then he goes to his crease. Yeah. The ball's sort of in a triangle that he doesn't quite form. He doesn't quite fold in there. Um, and the accidental thing is that I, I think if you do sort if you do see it live, I, I think it. I think it's very fair to say that it it could look accidental the minute you see a replay. Um, it is impossible to think that Matthew Wade was not making a V line uh, for for Mark Wood. I'd say at best, and I'm being really optimistic here. If you got a hundred judges in independent who knew the laws, I would say that eighty percent of them would say that it was definitely um, intentional. And there might be another twenty percent who'd be like, "I'm not sure it was intentional." That's the that's the best I can give you. Um, just one thing I want to add about Matthew Wade, which I'm sure you remember, is. This is the same Matthew Wade who once got suspended because in a shield game, he walked down the middle of the pitch um, doing pirouettes on the wicket to churn it up uh, during, I think it was during a tea break or a lunch break. He went out there early to doctor the wicket. You know, <laughs> th we could put that together with the fact he was once picked for sledging uh, the many, many yes. other uh, occasions that we've had uh, before. He's someone who pushes the boundaries of cricket. And in this particular case, he pushed the chest of Mark Wood what do you feel about Joss Butler coming out and saying, I probably would review that if it was a real game of cricket? I feel there's, I, I get why people are making fun of him on Twitter from this, but just on a very basic thing, they charged a lot of money for those tickets, right? They weren't, they weren't like five, five buck tickets because it was a warm up for a world cup. They were proper tickets. And I feel like if you're actually, if you're not calling it a warm up and it is actually an official um, T20 international, I don't know if a captain could come out afterwards and say that. I, I, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it doesn't matter at all. And maybe he wouldn't even do it in a World Cup. As, as you said, they were ahead in the game, so maybe he wouldn't even think he would have to. Yeah, I think it's also the the world we live in, Jared. Like At the end of the day, he's just giving his opinion. Uh, but, you know, giving your opinion uh, as a captain or whoever you are, even if you are uh, someone with some standing, doesn't seem to count these days if it doesn't go with... The, the popular opinion out there. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and look, we've been to um, millions of uh, press conferences, post-match press conferences. And I'm not saying you should not hold uh, the player or the captain accountable for he, what he or she says. Uh, but there are, I mean, if you just listen to him and just the expression on his face, I don't know whether he was saying it tongue-in-cheek. Like, we don't know. We weren't there True. to start with, right? Nor were a lot of people on social, or most of them on social media, who just completely buried him for just saying um, he, he would not, or you know, it wasn't a World Cup match. Uh, and, and just listening to what Josh Butler has been saying, I mean, oh, we're not even getting into the whole run out at the non-strikers end debate. Uh, but you know, he's just fresh of having said he wouldn't do, uh, you know, or he wouldn't go down that route, uh, having been a victim of it himself or a culprit, whichever way you look at that uh, <laughs> debate. 
you know, God, before I get cancelled once more. Uh, I think it, it, it's, but again, I think it's a sign of the world we live in. Uh, it, it was a silly thing for him to say, you can argue, uh, because of the climate in which he said it, uh, with so much talk about uh, these English players having their own rules and laws and their understanding of the spirit of the game. But again, I mean, if you as captain have decided or you as a team have decided, no, we we will not appeal for something similar if that happens. I mean, good luck to you. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, as an umpire, for example, I'll respect that. Yeah, I mean, I, I like I said earlier, um, as I walk back to square leg or walk back to my position behind the stumps, I might have a little giggle and even have, uh, you know, Pat Matthew wait on the uh, on the back and say, well done <laughs> for getting away with it. Uh, but again, it's it's up to the Josh Butler and I don't think he's done anything wrong by saying what he's said, um, nor, uh, you know, he's done anything wrong by not appealing for it. Hey, come on, like you... As a team, you can play the game whichever way you want to, uh, but it only comes out in a bad light if tomorrow you are uh, or you contradict yourself. Until the time he doesn't do that, look, it's it's uh, you know that's why going back to what we were discussing, why appeals need to be a part of the game and they'll never go away, uh, because the umpire or nobody does, should be given so much power that they control the game completely. Uh, um, the only thing I would add to that is I've got no problem if England decide they're never going to run anyone out at the non-strikers end. I've got no problem if um, uh, England decide they're never going to appeal for blatant uh, um, obstructing the fields or handed the balls or whatever. That's fine. Um, but they also have to understand that other teams are going to play to the laws of the game. And, yes. and instead of going on and on about all the other nonsense, they've decided to play the game one way. And, and that's all that it needs to be. Anyway, coming up after the break, let's talk about the actual World Cup, a tournament in which Joss Butler may <laughs> actually appeal for obstructing the field. You're listening to Cricket's Conversation on 99.94. Whatever your team, we have the show for you on podcast, YouTube, or on the 99.94 app. We have India, England, South Africa, West Indies, and now Sri Lanka covered. If you want to find us, the best way is to follow us on social media at 9994DM by downloading the 9994 app or Google 99.94 on podcast. We speak cricket. All right, mate. I have an 11 for you. And it, when I finish reading out this 11, what I would like you to do is I would like you to tell me where you think it would be ranked in terms of... Uh, the chances of winning this tournament. All right. Johnny Bairstow, Cameron Green, Fakir Zaman, Faf Duplessis, Shimron Hetmeyer, Andre Russell, Ravi Jadeja, Sunil Narain, Dwayne Pretorius, Jofra Archer, Jasper Bumra. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't, I had not thought of that uh, in that Would you like to bench? Yeah, That's just like... the 11. Let me give you the squad. We can, I, I think we okay, need to be cool. a bit more flexible with the squad. Um, the squad's not True. quite as strong, to be fair. But uh, if you're looking for a spinner, you could pick either Andy McBride, uh, Sandeep Lamachane, although at the moment, obviously, with him up on his charges, you probably would not want to mm. pick him. But uh, yes. Matt Parkinson is another option. Benny Howe. Uh, then I think if you want a couple of backup batters, I'd be looking at maybe Colin Munro or Duel Brevis. Um, and then if you want a backup fast bowler, how about Kyle Jamieson? <laughs> it's a pretty good uh, yeah, squad, I mean, no? Oh, sorry, it, it Rakim is. Cornwall. We forgot Rakim Cornwall as well. We could slot him in there somewhere as well. Very much so. I mean, fresh off a double hundred in a T20, yeah, as we saw. <laughs> now, I think um, uh, at least that's half of Mumbai Indians bowling attack for next season, right? If I'm not mistaken, Bumrah, Archer and Jadeja, or there have been reports, I don't know how true or not, that Jadeja is going to play for Mumbai Indians. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, but look, that's a that's a winning squad. Imagine if that's the squad you ended up with after an IPL auction. You would be very, very happy with uh, your chances in that season and maybe for the next two or three seasons. Or the UAE League where there's uh, where you can pick players from anywhere. But yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. I mean, I think I think that's if if you say I think England shortened after they beat Australia the other day, which doesn't really make any sense because Australia didn't use their full strength bowling lineup. But maybe because England smashed the ball so well that the bookies brought them in. Um, so I think oh. Australia and England are around three to one. India's around three and a half to four to one. Um, 
and I think there's a bit of a gap then uh, to South Africa, who are not oh. too far away as well. Um, this team, you know, and, and it's and it's weird as well because you've got you've got Besto, um who hurt himself playing golf. You got Ravi Jadeja, who hurt himself uh, on a surfboard in a swimming pool. I don't know if that's true. I don't actually know the full story about Ravi Jadeja, but that's in my <laughs> mind when it was explained to me. That's what the vision I got. Um, you got Fakir Saman, who got injured uh, recently. Uh, Dwayne Pretorius, did he break his finger or his thumb in the one day series against India? I'm trying to remember what the injury was. Um, I think something around his hand. Anyway, yeah. jo Jofra Archer, who. Everything from fish tank um, to elbow to whatever yeah. whatever his current problem is. Jasper Bumra, we haven't really heard much about his actual injury, uh, other than the fact that it's all going to be fine and then suddenly he couldn't play in the World Cup. Um, but I believe that's a back um, as, as it currently stands anyway. But you still have Cameron Green, who was left yeah. out, and now Australia seemed to be like playing him in a way that they are desperate to get him into the side while still saying maybe we're not. Faf Duplessis, who uh, I, tr I looked and looked. I couldn't see anywhere where he had officially retired. I think he's still available for T20 internationals for South Africa. Uh, same with Colin Munro on that one as well. Yeah. I couldn't find anywhere where either of them retired. Shimron Hetmeyer, of course, we have the situation where he didn't want to play um, um, and then the whole missing the plane twice thing. Yeah. Andre Russell made himself available. Sanon Narayan made himself available. Uh, hmm. Kyle Jamieson is in the I was in the IPL and didn't get picked um, in New Zealand squad. There's a lot of talent from freak injuries, from long term injuries, and then a lot of very good players who haven't been picked. I'm just trying to think, and, and and you know, I'll throw this to you. I can't think of another time when we've had so many good players not playing in a World Cup um, at once, and and maybe maybe I'll just, we just never noticed it before, and it happens all the time, hmm. but. What, Besto, Shimron Hetmeyer, Andre Russell, Sunil Narayan, Jofra Archer, uh, Jasper Bumrah, Ravi Jadeja. What are they? Are, are they in the best 30 T20 players in the world, maybe? Absolutely. I mean, some of them are future Hall of Famers. I mean, I'm sure at some point we're going to have a T20 League cricket um, or T20 cricket Hall of Fame, right? Whether it's an actual building somewhere or whether it's just a... Um, a, a, a section of I, I don't know where it'll be held or where uh, you will have the Hall of Fame or I, Dubai. I guess it would Dubai <laughs> would be the play, ideal place uh, you know where else but Dubai uh, because if it's if it's in India then the debate would be will there be any Pakistani cricketers on it and then we don't want to get into that debate maybe not uh, but but yeah I mean some um, if, if you think of Johnny Besto uh, Ravindra Jadeja Jasprit Bumrah Jofra Archer potentially could get into that, uh, you know, Hall of Famer list at some point. Russell and Narayan, more, for yeah. sure. Yeah, Russell and Narayan for sure. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Colin Munro also, you could argue, as a, a future Hall of Famer or a potential Hall of Famer. So, yeah, I mean, you're talking the who's who of the T20 world. Faf Duplessis, in, definitely, in that list as well. Uh, so, I, I think, no, I think you are right. Maybe this is the first time we, we are, we're in a World Cup season where so many high profile performers in that particular format are, are missing out. Um, I can't think of a time, uh, even go back to the 50 over World Cup era where there was no T20 cricket, where uh, you'd see like the occasional one or two players missing out mm. uh, from two key teams. Uh, but this is, I am sure if you extend this uh, list, Jared, to like Ireland and Scotland and Netherlands, there might be others who will stand out as well. Uh, well, you know, if you go in, to recent retirements, because we've had a lot of retirements between the tournament, you, you can add Gail, Pollard, Bravo, Kyle Kutza. Um, you would have uh, Ryan Tentascata would be another one off the top of my head. So, yeah, if you go if you go on that thing, uh, on, that, on that particular, uh, Ross Taylor, I suppose. Did Ross Taylor play in the last yeah. World Cup? Yeah. Um, he did. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of guys who just left the game recently as well. So it really does feel like something quite dramatic. And it's look, as I said, there's there's so many different stories here. Like the Cameron Green one's quite funny in that he never looked like he understood T20 cricket to till about a month ago, and now exactly. he looks like one of the best players on, on earth. Um, Shimron Hetmeyer is obviously funny for a whole different reason. Um, and then you've got, you know, long-term injuries and a couple of, you know, recent injuries, which which are, which are you know, never good for anyone. Here's my question. There's Johnny Bairstow and Jofra Archer. 
right? You've got Ravi Jadeja and Jasper Bumrah. And then you've got Shimon Hetmeyer, Andre Russell, and Sun on Orion. If you want to throw Rakim Cornwall in, you can also in, into yeah. that list. Which team is legitimately worse off uh, with the players they're missing? I, I would say it has to be India, right? Because you're talking about uh, two of the, not just key players in terms of the roles that they, that they play, but the entire balance of that Indian side depends a lot on what Jadeja and Bumrah do. Without Bumrah, yeah, I mean, there have been other guys who put their hand up to pull in the death overs, the young Arshdeep Singh, who I'm a big fan of, um, Harshal Patel. But it's not the same without Jasprit Bumrah, right? Like if you, with Jasprit Bumrah in the side, you know, even if it is uh, you're defending seven and over going into the last two or three overs, you still give, you'll give yourself a chance. Uh, maybe Arshdeep or Harshal could, you know, turn the game your way, but it, they don't, they're not, as certified to do that as a Jasprit Bumrah. And, and with Jadeja, especially the way his batting's come, uh, come through in the last few years in all formats, uh, he, he, with Jadeja on this side, you can play around with your playing 11 a lot more, uh, which you can't without him. Yes, I mean, Aksar Patel is someone who's, uh, you know, taking the world by storm. And uh, again, his batting has really come of age in the last two years. He could always bat in... Uh, hit some big shots. but uh, And I think in first-class cricket, he, he's a genuine batter. Uh, but it's good to see uh, how his batting has come along. And maybe you could say he's a like-for-like -like replacement, but when you st at, at in 2022, in October 2022, if you put Aksar Patel and Ravindra Jadeja face-to-face, -face, you would still want Jadeja. Even mm. maybe Aksar Patel will end up uh, uh, with... I, I don't know whether he'll end up with better numbers, but maybe he'll like just take his game to a next level and go leave Jadeja behind for potentially. Uh, but, you know, Jadeja has been alongside a Kohli and a Bumrah, arguably, and Ashwin, the most influential Indian cricketer in the last three or four years. So I think India, you would think, are the most affected. West Indies have almost decided to, um, you know, do away with that whole group of, uh, mm. you know, former champions or, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and they, they've gotten used to not playing with Sunil Narayan and to an extent Andre Russell as well. Mm. You know, maybe not so much in a World Cup without Russell, but, you know, they played the last World Cup without Narayan. And with Akhil Hussain and uh, Yannick uh, Karaya, who I was very impressed with uh, in the two games against Australia, uh, maybe they have some something new to, to play with. Um, yeah... Uh, and I think also maybe, Jared, I was just thinking about it. Maybe we uh, these absentees are being highlighted a lot more because of how close these two World Cups are. Maybe mm -hmm. if this World Cup was played next year, uh, you there would, wouldn't be that recency bias in terms of... We wouldn't even mention the likes of Gale and Bravo because it would have been two years. And two years in the T20 World is a, a long time, as we've seen, because of the amount of cricket that gets played. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I think... Yeah, the India one's interesting because Akshar's done so well. You obviously can't replace Bumrah. Um, and, I mean, Arshdeep's done well. And I think Harshal's probably not even quite a death bowler. I think he's probably better in, you know, middle overs to early death. So if they get down to a close game, they are just not going to feel as comfortable, right? So there's there, India has that yeah. problem. And then Jadeja allows you to play someone genuinely in the top six who can bowl right? That's not the case for Akshar. As good as he's been, as you said, he might continue to yeah. develop, but I think he is probably going to be a number seven just because of the kind of player he is. When you're at number seven, you don't quite transform the entire 11 the way you do if you're bat at number six. It's so it's so different, the, the impact that you can have on, on the team. That's huge. England's is quite interesting because Bairstow is the most replaceable because Alex Hales is already um, there and they've already, and they've got Joss Butler, right? So, you know, even if, even if, Bairstow was the frontline wicketkeeper in that side. They'd still have a backup. In fact, they've got about eight wicketkeepers in that squad, probably, knowing England. I haven't even counted them all. Phil Salt, is he there? <laughs> True, yeah. um, but, you know, they've always got backup wicketkeepers. So is, you don't have to yeah. worry about that. Archer is a problem. But the thing is, the only way England's going to win this World Cup anyway, probably, is by outscoring everyone. Like, literally scoring 25 yeah. to 30 runs more per par. So I'm not saying Archer... If you come down to it, again, the similar situation we're talking before where it's, you know, last couple of overs, yes, you would pr prefer to have Archer there. But realistically, if England's going to win this, it's on batting. So you, you don't lose much from best, though. The West Indies one's really interesting because if you do put, if you put Hetmeyer in that lineup, they would have had Mayers, uh, Lewis, Puran, Hetmeyer, Odeon Smith, Akil Hussain, Jason Holder. Um, 
they have a bunch of players who have a lot of power and all round skills, right? So they basically have Hetma is almost the only specialist that I just mentioned. Even Akil is saying who couldn't bat till about well until earlier this year. Suddenly he's hitting fours and sixes everywhere, right? They don't have a great team, but with Hetmeyer in there, you're just like, well, if he plays a similar role to what he has been able to do in the IPL, he could maybe carry them through and maybe one of the guys at the top or one of the guys at the end goes nuts, right? But realistically, um, uh, that team was probably going to stink up the place anyway. And the, I'm not sure that they suddenly would have been a great oh. team with Andre Russell, Sun on Narayan. And if you play Sun on Narayan, I'm not sure if you can fit Rakim Cornwall in the 11 anyway, because you've basically got two guys who can't yep. field. Um, yeah. uh, uh, who, you know, who can't run between the wickets, who both play the, very similar and one's a much better bowler than the other one and one's a much better batter than the other one and they both bowl off spin. So uh, I, th I think you're right. I think the India one's quite interesting, but it, it is weird how so much of this tournament is going to, like Australia is the favourite at the moment, right? Although, as I said, England's odds have come right in. Um, uh, Australia is the favourite at the moment, partially just because they haven't had any major injuries or any major... Um, omissions or anything. And then biggest omission is literally not being able to fit a guy into the team who looks like he might be one of the best openers at this tournament. So it, it's a completely different situation to be in. If you look at the 11s, there's a whole Aaron Finch, Steve Smith thing, but we'll leave that for another episode because mm. I couldn't possibly go back into that again. It would make my brain hurt. Uh, but I do think that for England, <laughs> the main reason they can't win this World Cup is because they didn't pick Benny Howe. But um, we'll chat again after the break. If you love the language of cricket and want more, then head over to the 99.94 app and you can hear all of our podcasts and cricket commentary. We're adding new shows all the time and covering cricket series from all over the world. Be the first to hear all of our announcements by following us on social media at 99.94 DM. Welcome to Cricket's Conversation. Welcome back. Uh, obviously, um, myself, Jared Kimber, and Barra Sundarayson here on the microphone. And so far, neither of us have said the phrase cock. Um, but if you do have children in the room, well, I've already said it once, and we're probably going to have to say it a couple of times. For those who don't know, Pakistan and New Zealand were playing some of their games before the World Cup. And Glenn Phillips, the wicket keeper slash smasher of balls, He's not just a wicket keeper, is he? He's a wicket keeper. He's a bowler. He's he's every he's the truest all rounder in the world at the moment. Um, uh, had the I uh, had the uh, um, uh, microphone on him as we often see in T Twenty cricket. And uh, what length or what <laughs> what length did he suggest, uh, Barat, that uh, the New Zealand bowlers would have to deliver? Uh, and you know, before we get into it, it was an all male <laughs> commentary box as well. Uh, so, which kind of maybe and look, and we'll get into it uh, as we talk about this when you're mic'd up on the field, uh, and, and it happens right. At, I think toward the start of the over, or he gets asked like, "What length you uh, the bowlers are planning to bowl?" And he goes, "Well, cock height length." Uh, <laughs> and the way I I think about, and he says it so matter of factly, is clearly he's just overheard or maybe been a part of the discussion where the uh, that term has been used by either the bowlers or or Kane Williamson or whoever was involved in that meeting. So he's just come off this meeting or come off this chat uh, and he gets asked by um, an all-male commentary box about what length they're bowling. And, and he just says it and goes on about like, you know, nobody stalls, he just goes on about it. But, uh, hey, and the one thing you missed out about Glenn Phillips is overall nice guy. I don't know whether you saw that other clip of his where he hits a six and it hits a child and he uh, yeah. goes and checks on the child. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, it was very, it looked very scary. I, I, I hope the child is fine. I heard that uh, he or she was taken to hospital. I think they were taken to hospital and they were okay. I did see a follow-up article that suggested that they were okay. But yeah, it was a nasty oh, hit. that's good. It was, yeah. And uh, I've never seen uh, a match finish where, like, you know, someone hits a six and they start running towards the boundary. I, the only time I've seen that is in Jamaica when Marlon Samuels won uh, uh, a one-day for West Indies against India in 2011 and ran straight towards Chris Gale in happier times when they were much better or much closer to each other. And Chris Gale was uh, partying in the stands. This was during the whole standoff with the West Indies cricket board. And I wasn't too far away from Chris Gale, not partying with him, uh, but I was around. And uh, that's the only time I've seen that happen. But this was like in different circumstances. But but yeah, I mean, going back to the Glenn Phillips thing, it's something that 
uh, always worries me when you have players mic'd up. Yes, it makes for great television as we've seen around the world. But, you know, there are times when uh, uh, there might be some of them who are not so focused on what they're saying, but what's happening on the field. And also when it comes to stuff like this, and you can't censor it on air, it's live, right? And I'll tell you when I was really scared. Is when Pakistan toured Australia, Jared, maybe, what, three years ago, 2019-20. And they played a few T20s before their tests. Um, and uh, can we mention mention a TV channel or yes. leave out the name? Oh, okay, no, sorry. Uh, so, you know, Fox had um, uh, some of the Pakistanis, uh, Wahab Riyaz in particular, uh, mic'd up while he was bowling. And they would say, all right, we're just going to lis- listen in, which is all well and good. But later on, I did ask one of the producers, like, did you have someone in the box who knew Urdu or Hindi? They were like, no, not really. I'm like, so he could have said whatever. He could have said, like, you know, uh, stuff which could, you know, accidentally have been overheard by bookies or whoever else who wants to listen to it. He could have cussed someone out. He could have said anything and you wouldn't have been aware. They were like, that's a very good point. <laughs> so, you know, that is, that, that is a little concerning for me. I mean, you... You can maybe get away with it with uh, with a wicket keeper or like you know one of those, uh, because as you know, once it's out there, it's out there, right? You mm-hmm. can't take it away. Uh, and, and it's at some levels unfair on the on the cricketer, if that makes sense. Uh, even though you agree to do it, I mean, it, uh, with some certain broadcast deals, it's part of. Uh, part of the deal, part of your contract, where you could be mic'd up, I guess. Uh, but it is going to lead to you know borderline funny incidents like this. Here, it's very funny. I mean, you know, funny in the sense, yeah, I mean, you can laugh about it, at least as a man, uh, because it wasn't said in any uh, other context as like, he was just repeating what he had just heard, yeah. I'm assuming. Uh, but it can, it can like, you know, it can be dangerous as well. I'm sure you'll agree. Yeah, I'm, I, I, it's the whole thing's really interesting. So in basketball, um, it happens, I think, almost every game, every, or maybe it's every major game, they, they mic someone up, but they play the footage back and they check and obviously they beep out the swearing, right? Um, <laughs> and, and not that all swearing needs to be beeped out, you know, you, you get different things, but it's quite clearly in this game, there wasn't supposed to be mention of a cock. Um, as far as I'm aware, I, I don't remember the full thing. The other thing I thought was quite interesting is that when I worked as an analyst, like players do talk about bowling a length from balls to nipples, you know, or balls to tits, <laughs> yeah. or, you know, whatever phrase they use. I've never heard cock, yeah. cock height length before, but that was new. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that, that is the way that players, you know, decide some will say hip, some will say groin, some will say balls, right? Like that, that is something. Yeah, exactly. But uh, the thing I thought about was, do you remember the big bash game when the broadcasters inadvertently broke the anti-corruption rule by giving uh, Brad Hodge information when he was captain? about matchups during the game and it got even more confusing because the person who had given them the information for fox sports was laurie colliver who was the former south australian analyst and I'm not, he may have even been the current south australian analyst but he wasn't doing the big bash um and he was giving the adelaide strikers captain brad hodge information on the field um and i remember the icc had to look into that to make sure that it was all all legit so we're not allowed to talk to players when they're actually in, in the ground. So it's called the, wait, I've got to get this right. PMOA area, isn't it? The uh, players, mm, match, yes. of fish, initials, uh, match only officials, match officials area. Yeah, whatever yeah. it is. So you're not, a, you're not yeah. supposed to yeah. really talk to anyone while they're playing. Now, obviously in cricket, that's kind of impossible because people are talking to players across the boundary all the time. And, you know, um, uh, a couple of years ago, one of the players got lost and actually ended up in the press box when they meant to be, when they meant to go to their change room. You know, things like that happen. But it is quite interesting that we allow this to happen. But I think mostly it's just funny because cock height length doesn't really make sense if you say it out loud. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like he's 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 you know whoever came up with the actual phrase. Um, I get it, but also it's um, once you put cock and length in the one sentence. Um, it's it's all a bit messy. Yeah, but... that's true. Yeah, that kind of <laughs> makes for, yeah. I mean, in another context, it would make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are um, some conversations where cock height length make a lot of sense, uh, or like maybe are uh, uh, the fulcrum of that conversation, but not <laughs> not in this not in this sense. And, and also, like you know, uh, uh, what you were talking about, I, going back to that Wahab Riaz incident, like. Even him saying that, okay, the next two overs will be bored by so-and-so overs. 
well, I mean, are you giving away information? And he's not doing it with any, uh, you know, because he's, again, in the heat of the battle. If you suddenly ask him, so what are you looking at? Like, what's the strategy moving forward? Uh, it's very obvious that he'll just say uh, that 17th will be bowled by Irfan and 18th will be bowled by Mohamed Amir or whoever. Uh, but again, that can also be used, you know, uh, or is that anti-corruption as well? I don't know. So that the, it could lead to situations which could be odd for all parties concerned. So it's always, um, it, it's uh, and I don't see it going away. I'm sure players mm -hmm. will continue to be mic'd up because yeah, at time, most times it makes for great television, right? I mean, you think back to the great Shane Vaughan bowling, Brendan McCullum, all those things are great. But uh, in fact, I remember way back, Jared, the first time I saw that happen, honestly, was with this veterans tournament in the Veterans World Cup uh, back in 94 or 95 when uh, uh, I think Graham Gooch was bowling to Desmond Haynes uh, or the long time back but that that's the first time i saw that happen that technology being used and i was like wow that's that's the kind of insight you you don't get like so it, it's cool till it's cool yeah i think i think you're right um it's weird that we don't allow players to touch their mobile phones but they can give messages to a uh, hundred million people potentially watching a cricket <laughs> game on tv um my favorite one ever though was adam gilchrist when he was facing john lewis in a t20 game so it must have been one of the first t20 games might have even been the first t20 game that england played in australia or it might be the first one sorry england and Australia played, or it was the first one in in Australia. But it was yeah. really early on in T20 cricket. And Adam Gilchrist, they were uh, uh, whoever the commentator was, had done no research and was saying, "Oh, Gilly must have faced this guy before encountered cricket. What's his life?" And Gilly's like, "He's a pretty good bowler. He's a tricky customer." Blah blah blah. And next ball gets down, Sog sweeps him for over six, uh, uh, over mid wicket for six, which <laughs> which uh, which uh, does tell you that he was living a completely different uh, career arc to every other human being that's ever played the sport. But um, yeah, it's really interesting. And Anyway, I won't ask you about your cock height length. I'll just let you go and I'll talk to you again next week. Thanks for coming on. No worries. I'm still disappointed that you didn't let me talk about the Henry Hunt's innings in the Shield, but we'll, we'll leave it for later in the season.